Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're talking about something really important in emergency medicine, rapid sequence intubation, or RSI. It's a technique we use to quickly get control of someone's airway when they're having trouble breathing or can't protect their airway themselves. We're going to break it down using the seven Ps. It's a great way to remember the key steps and make sure everything goes smoothly. So when do we use RSI? Well, think of situations like respiratory failure, when someone's lungs just aren't working well enough. Or if someone has a really low level of consciousness and can't protect their airway from things like vomit. We also use it if there's an obvious blockage in the airway or if someone needs emergency surgery. Now, RSI is a bit different from a regular intubation. The big difference is that we give medications to make the patient unconscious and relax their muscles really quickly, all at the same time. This is super important because when someone's airway is compromised, there's a serious risk of them inhaling stomach contents into their lungs. That's called aspiration, and we want to avoid it at all costs. To make sure we do everything right, we follow the seven Ps. It's like a checklist to keep us on track. Let's start with the first P. Preparation and plan. This is where we get everything ready. We gather all the gear the laryngoscope, different sizes of endotracheal tubes, suction, an oxygen supply, all the necessary medications, sedatives, paralytics, even reversal agents just in case, monitoring equipment, and, crucially, backup plans if the first attempt doesn't go as planned. We also make sure everyone on the team knows their role, who's managing the airway, who's giving medications, who's monitoring the patient. And we always have a backup plan in case we run into a difficult airway you always have to be prepared for anything. Next up is pre-oxygenation. The goal here is to load up the patient's lungs with as much oxygen as possible. We usually do this by giving them 100% oxygen through a non-rebreather mask for a few minutes. If they're able to, we'll ask them to take some deep breaths. Sometimes we might even use a bag valve mask to help them breathe. The reason we do this is that it gives us a little more time during the intubation process before their oxygen levels start to drop. The third P is pretreatment. This is where we give medications to try and prevent some of the side effects that can happen during intubation. Some common ones include lidocaine, which can help prevent increases in pressure inside the skull, fentanyl, which can help prevent spikes in blood pressure and heart rate, and sometimes atropine, especially in kids, to prevent their heart rate from slowing down too much. The specific medications we use can vary depending on the patient and the situation. Now we get to the core of RSI, paralysis and induction. This is where we give the medications that make the patient unconscious and relax their muscles. We give these medications simultaneously to achieve rapid control of the airway. Let's talk about the common choices. For induction, to make the patient unconscious, we have a few options. Ketamine, this is often our go-to choice, especially in emergencies. It provides good sedation and pain relief, and it usually doesn't cause a big drop in blood pressure, which is really important if the patient is already unstable. Propofol works really fast, but it can cause a significant drop in blood pressure. So, we tend to reserve it for patients who are hemodynamically stable, meaning their blood pressure is good, or in specific situations like when we need to lower pressure inside the skull or stop seizures quickly. Midazolam is another sedative, but it can also lower blood pressure, so it's generally not our first choice for RSI, especially in emergency situations. Right after we give the induction agent, we give a paralytic to relax the muscles. Again, we have a couple of main options. Succinylcholine is a very fast-acting paralytic. It works within about a minute, and it wears off quickly too. This is great for RSI because it allows us to intubate quickly, and if we have trouble getting the tube in, the patient will start breathing again on their own relatively soon. However, it can cause some side effects like muscle twitching and changes in potassium levels, so we have to be careful. Rocuronium is another paralytic that works a little slower than succinylcholine, but it lasts longer. It's a good alternative if we can't use succinylcholine for some reason. The timing of these medications is crucial. The paralytic is typically given immediately after the sedative. After the patient is paralyzed, we move on to protection and positioning. We want to get them in the best position for intubation, which is called the sniffing position. It's where their head is slightly tilted back and their neck is flexed. This helps us see the vocal cords clearly. 
we also use to routinely apply pressure to the cricoid cartilage, that's called the selic maneuver, to try and prevent stomach contents from going into the lungs. However, there's some debate about how effective that is, so it's not always done anymore. The next P is placement with proof. This is where we actually insert the endotracheal tube into the trachea. This is the moment of truth. So here's a quick rundown of the intubation process itself. First, we pick up the laryngoscope, making sure the light is working. We hold it in our left hand. We gently open the patient's mouth and insert the laryngoscope blade. There are two main types of blades, a curved Macintosh blade and a straight Miller blade. We'll choose the appropriate one for the patient. With the Macintosh blade, we advance it along the tongue until we see the epiglottis. Then, we lift the laryngoscope upwards, not backwards, to expose the vocal cords. With the Miller blade, we advance it past the epiglottis and lift directly on the epiglottis to visualize the cords. Now, how well we see those vocal cords is really important. We use what's called the cormac lehane grading system to describe the view we get. A grade 1 view is the best. We see the entire glottis, including the vocal cords and the opening between them. A grade 2 view means we see part of the glottis, but not the whole thing. We might only see the posterior portion or the arytenoids. A grade 3 view means we only see the epiglottis, and we have to infer the position of the vocal cords. And a grade 4 view is the worst. We can't even see the epiglottis. Ideally, we want a grade 1 or 2 view to make intubation as easy and safe as possible. If we get a grade 3 or 4 view, we might need to use different techniques like external laryngeal manipulation, where someone pushes on the outside of the neck to try and improve the view, or use a bougie, which is a flexible introducer that we can slide into the trachea and then thread the endotracheal tube over. Video laryngoscopes are also extremely helpful in these situations. Once we see the vocal cords, we take the endotracheal tube in our right hand and carefully insert it through the cords until the cuff, that little balloon at the end is just past them. We want to see the black line on the tube just past the cords. Now that the tube is in, we remove the laryngoscope. We immediately inflate the cuff with air to create a seal in the trachea. This is super important to prevent air leaks and aspiration. Now that the tube is in, we have to make absolutely sure it's in the right place. We do this in a few ways. We look to see the tube go through the vocal cords during insertion, we listen for breath sounds in both lungs, and over the stomach, we use capnography which measures the carbon dioxide in their breath. This is the gold standard for confirming placement, and we'll usually get a chest x-ray afterwards just to double check and make sure there are no complications. If we hear gurgling sounds over the stomach or don't see a good capnography waveform, we need to suspect esophageal intubation and pull the tube out and try again. And finally, we have post-intubation management. Once we've confirmed the tube is in the right place, we secure it with tape or a special holder. Then we connect the patient to a ventilator and set it to the right settings. We'll get another chest x-ray to confirm the tube is still in the correct position and to check for any problems. And of course, we'll keep a close eye on their vital signs and other important things. Now, it's really important to remember that RSI is a complex procedure that requires proper training and a lot of practice. This video is just for informational purposes and shouldn't replace formal medical training. Thanks for watching. If you found this helpful, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more medical education content.